Nice seeing you again. March 27, week nine. We're counting down. This is minus six. Minus six weeks from the end of the semester. Which also means, a reminder, have you picked a film for the final paper? Are you sketching out a draft, an outline with ideas on how to make it relevant for this class? Do you need any help from me? to pick a film based on your interest, on the kind of material ideas, themes you're comfortable with, or for ideas on how to structure the paper, let me know. Under week nine, you find a full page devoted to this week's film, Thelma and Louise, including required readings, and instructions about this week's assignment, which is the second film essay. And there are some specific instructions you will find there. Perhaps I will talk more about it on Wednesday, but go see the instructions and pay especially special attention to the last point in the instruction, which tells you not to focus exclusively on the theme of feminism, which is, of course, a big theme in this film. And you find a million essays and a million papers already done by students during the last 30 years on this. Most of them are not really satisfying. Most of them don't really reflect the complexity of the treatment of the theme in this film, most of them suffer from a literal treatment of the example from the film. What I want you to do is to pay more attention to the connection between feminism and the theme of being on the road and the freedom granted by being on the road. Keep in mind that until now, we haven't really seen important female characters in our road movies, right? Yes, we found the girl in Tulane Blacktop, but she's a secondary character. Ultimately, she leaves the driver and the mechanic and she disappears from the film. We've seen Anne in A Man and a Woman, but again, her role is not really central to the theme of being on the road because the driver is Jean-Louis, right? Now, finally, we find a road movie with two women as protagonists. So this has further significance, right? If you want to treat the theme of feminism, you cannot avoid keeping this in mind. But the second requirement that you find in the instructions for this film's for, for this week's film essay is to include some significant comparisons, connections with at least one of the other films that we have discussed up until this point. And I suggest that you keep in mind especially Detour, The Hitchhiker, and Il Sorpasso. And in the film notes that you find posted on the class website, I have developed, I have listed some points that connect those movies visually, stylistically, or thematically, and you can do more on your own. So you have plenty of material. Under week nine, you not only find the usual links to eight or nine reviews, but you also find links to a number of articles that you find freely accessible through JSTOR. JSTOR is accessible through your Stony Brook library, meaning if you log in with your Stony Brook credentials, then you can read everything on JSTOR. And you find my notes, which are essential but detailed enough to allow you uh, a, a comprehensive analysis of the film. So now in the classroom, I don't want to boringly go through those notes and expand them. I will use this schema 
to talk about the film, the story, the synopsis, the characters, and the themes. And then, either today or Wednesday, I will show you scenes and I will get into the mechanics of the visuals of the film and the editing of the film. Thelma Louise is a film from 1991. It was a big success that year. It was nominated for six Oscars, Best Director, uh, two nominations for Best Actress, which rarely happens that two actresses from the same film are both nominated. Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon were both nominated for Best Actress. Best Original Screenplay, which was the only Oscar the film won. Kelly Curry, and uh, Best Photography or Cinematography, you have the list in the notes of all the Oscar nominations. The director was already a big shot at the time, Ridley Scott was already famous. He had done a small uh, artsy film, uh, which, which is really nice if you find it online, The Duellants with Arvid Keitel in 1977. More importantly, two years later, he directed Alien, the first uh, uh, film uh, which became a successful franchise, right, with many uh, sequels. And Ridley Scott went on to shoot a lot of big budget movie. He's still active, right? He, he did The Last Duel uh, that came out last year or at the beginning of this year, although it was a bit of a flop. Uh, but and, and his, he was born in 1937, so he's 80, 85, going to uh, turn 86 this year, but still active in cinema. Since he was already a, a big director, by the time he shot this movie, what happens was that this script was written in the mid-1980s by Kali Curry, who was a video producer and uh, wanted to be a director as well. She got this idea while driving her car and spent six months writing the script. And then, as usual, she went around. The script was rejected by uh, a lot of people until someone in the staff, in the company of Ridley Scott, when a director becomes important, they form a company they want to produce themselves or co-produce their films. And Ridley Scott read the script, he liked it, and he said, okay, we're buying it for half a million, which was a lot of money at that time for a script. Script were not paying very well in the past. And uh, he thought he would uh, uh, pick a director, another director, and, and Ridley Scott's company would be uh, producing the film, uh, he got a, a few refusals and uh, decided to direct the film himself. And, and, and you can see that the film is not exactly his style. When you see those big uh, chases with uh, more than a dozen uh, police cars, helicopters, etc., that's more in the style of Ridley Scott was probably also a ploy to make this into the kind of movie that people come to see it because it has this heroic quality, right? But it seemed a bit forced on the film itself. Um, and um, for the casting, since the idea of the movie uh, came out in 1988, but they took two years to, to actually shoot it. The initial picks were then replaced by, by more. So they went through three series of two actresses to play the parts of Thelma and Louise, including names such as Jodie Foster, Mary Streep, etc. And finally, they settled on Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon, and that was really a wonderful choice. They, they, they worked, very, worked very well in uh, this film. Okay, so let's talk about the film. At the beginning of the film, you find in the setup, in the initial setup, where the uh, 
main characters are introduced, you find Thelma and Louise in their typical environment. So you find Thelma in the kitchen of her house in the morning, preparing breakfast and assisting her husband, Daryl, who is on his way to work. Uh, Daryl is a regional manager of a company selling carpet, carpet tiles, right? And you find Louise in the kitchen of a diner and also in the hall of the diner where she works as a waitress. Her relationship is quite different from Thelma's relationship. So Thelma has this jerk of a husband, big a-hole, and in fact some of the reviews from the time focus on this uh, overly negative representation of men in the film. There is a single man that comes out uh, unscathed, but Daryl is almost too much, almost a caricature of a bad husband. And in both situations, the theme in the premise is submission. So clearly Thelma has to play the part of the submissive wife to Daryl. Daryl is in control. Daryl wants to be served by her. Not only that, but he wants to be treated in a certain way. For example, during the initial scene that we will eventually either today or Wednesday see together, Daryl gives her instructions. Not only he wants to, to, to be served breakfast, but he wants to be greeted in the morning by a certain kind of wife. So he gives her instruction on how her role should be played. Okay, So he is controlling, and clearly it doesn't have any real leadership, right? Because you, you, you can see he is a jerk. Interestingly, the visual props, the visual elements in the environment of Thelma that tells you something about this character are a lot of clips. The kitchen is full of clips on the fridge, on the walls of the kitchen. And this gives you an idea of the ebullient creativity, the spirit that Thelma is repressing because of her husband. So clearly, Thelma has a lot of plans, a lot of ambitions, but she cannot pursue any of those plans because of Daryl. Later on, we will learn that they got married early, that they uh, um, went out see, for, for four years. She, I believe she, since she was 17, she hasn't had a lot of experience with other men, and she's not satisfied. Clearly, she's not satisfied in the relationship. She's not sexually satisfied either. Daryl is also not really that interested in her in the initial scene. We learn that every Friday he comes home late, and she says, how comes all the sales are done late on Friday evening? Clearly, Daryl is going out after his job by himself instead of going back home. And when Thelma will leave the house with Louis without asking for his permission, because he wouldn't give her permission to go and spend the weekend at a cabin fishing, later we see that he never came home through the first part of the night. That is to say that Daryl, that night, the night of the first day in the film, came home only the next morning, right? So we know that he's not out selling carpet. That is having fun possibly uh, even with other women. And we found Louise in the, key, in the diner's kitchen, in the hall of the kitchen, where she has to professionally play the part of a submissive character to her customers, right? So it's temporary, right? Her submission, unlike Thelma's submission, is temporary because it's only when she is in the diner in the kitchen that she has to be subjected to the authority of others or to the whims of the customers. However, there is something else about Louise. We see that Louise of the two characters is the more mature one. 
right? And think uh, for a moment about Bruno and Roberto, although things are more complicated in the interaction between Thelma and Luis, the way the characters develop and the way they switch uh, uh, their, their roles or their dominance in, in the duo. What we learn, what we feel that is slightly off about Luis, something that you feel more and more through the movie, is that Luis is submissive in a way because she's oppressed not by Jimmy, her relationship, because she has picked Jimmy because Jimmy's a musician and he's on the road all the time. And Louise has picked Jimmy exactly because she doesn't want to be controlled by a man. She wants to be free. She wants to be loved. And Jimmy provides some of that. But Jimmy himself is a jerk. Jimmy himself can be jealous and controlling. However, he's not there. And therefore, Louise is uh, freer. And when eventually we will see the policeman, Hal Flockham, entering the house of Louise, because at this point they're criminals wanted by the police and by the FBI, we will see that Louise's home is the opposite of Thelma's home. Thelma's home is full of things, because this is Thelma. This is Thelma's spirit that wants to create, wants to explore. And Louise's house is bare, is essential, is clean like a CSI lab, because Louise is dead inside, because Louise is oppressed by her own trauma, because Louise, so Thelma uh, uh, outside of a saloon uh, will be the target of an attempted rape by Harlan, and Louise it will, will, will only be because Louise takes, up, takes out a gun and points it at Harlan that Thelma is not raped. Louise herself, though, was raped. And this left a strong trauma in her and, and killed her spirit, killed her vitality. So keep this in mind, that the fact that Thelma survived and then thrives in the second part of the film is what might have happened to Louise if someone had saved Louise from being raped. So Louise is temporarily uh, submit, submissive in the kitchen, but she's, she's oppressed not by a man, but more by the trauma of the rape she suffered in Texas. So, this is the initial setup, and you already have at the beginning a small detail that represents the anticipation of a twist, right? And the fact that Thelma is packing a lot of things, so many things that later on the police will think that she planned to leave the house, not to go for a weekend. At, a, at the cabin of someone, a friend of Louise's, she picks from the drawer of the bedroom, she picks a, a, a 38 special, a, a handgun, a revolver, right? And this is the anticipation of the twist in the film. The two women are going fishing, which is another odd thing, right? The first odd thing you see, she gets a gun, and, and you know, uh, what, what producers used to say in the 1930s, and it's included, for example, even in a manuscript by uh, Scott Fitzgerald, uh, if you show a gun, the gun will be used, right? Otherwise, you don't show a gun in the film. So this is the first odd thing. The second odd thing is that you have two women going fishing, and this is reminiscent, of course, of the hitchhiker, right? And also indicative of the theme of reversals of roles, male roles, feminine roles, female roles, right? Uh, um, the idea that something that is commonly associated with men is uh, considered by women, and one of them says, we don't know how to fish, and the other says, well, your husband is fishing. How difficult can it be? It's a jerk. It's not very smart, so we can do that. And they get 
uh, to the road uh, uh, in Louisa's car, which is a beautiful 1966 Ford Thunderbird convertible. And of course, the car is their first uh, um, expression of freedom. So we go from submission to freedom within the next 15 minutes in the film. The car is indicative of their freedom. They laugh, they chat, they have a good time. And you have the real twist, right? This was just a clue, just a hint. The first real twist is the detour, the deviation, right? Their destination, their planned destination is a cabin because Louise said that she has a friend. Uh, he has to give up this cabin and he's lending it to friends uh, until the moment he will uh, have to, to sell uh, the cabin. And, and they're in Arkansas, if I didn't mention uh, that the cabin is somewhere in Arkansas. However, Thelma is so happy to be out of the house and free from her husband's control that she says, can we stop? Can we stop at a place to have a drink, to have fun, right? Which is something they do, unlike the characters in The Hitchhiker who drive through Mexicali without stopping, even though one of them would like to stop. This time, they both stop at this Saloon. And then the saloon uh, is a combination of the themes of submission and freedom. Of course, there is freedom. Finally, there is no one to control them. And therefore, they can drink, they can dance with men. We notice different attitudes, right? Thelma wants to drink, Louise doesn't want to drink. Because Louise wants to remain in control. Then, because Thelma insists, Louise herself will have drinks. Thelma would like to dance and would like to flirt with men. Louise keeps to herself, then she will reluctant, the same way that she reluctantly agreed to drink in, she will reluctantly dance with a man, whereas Thelma goes all in, she's very naive, inexperienced, with this other a-hole of a man, Harlan, who will uh, uh, event will make her drink more uh, than she wants. Um, she, he, he will spin her violently, uh, uh, strongly while they're dancing so that she feels sick. At that point, she says, I'm sick, I'm feeling sick. He says, let's go to the parking lot because he wants to have sex with her. He wants to remove her from the dancing floor to have sex with her. And they go to the parking lot. She's really sick. She doesn't want to have sex with him at all. And uh, lets him know that Arlan will first beat up uh, Thelma. Then she, he will try to have sex with her. And there you have the return of the theme of submission under a man's will and authority. However, the second and most important twist in the story that will propel the rest of the narrative occurs, Louise comes out with Thelma's gun and tells this guy, stop, points the gun at his head. Thelma can withdraw they both walk away a few steps from Harlan. However, Louise talks to Harlan the way she would have liked to talk to the man who raped her in Texas. Louise tells him when a woman is crying and saying no, she is not having a good time. She doesn't want to have sex with you, right? But Louise, keep in mind, has been through this kind of episode. We will learn later. So this is Louise talking to a man who represents the man that raped her. And when Harlan talks back, because Harlan is a jerk, Louise shoots her, shoots him, and kills him. Okay? At this point, this is the big twist. This is the beginning, really the beginning of the road trip. Because they have committed a murder. And they leave the scene of crime because they think, especially Louise, 
no one will believe us. Because you, Thelma, have been spending the whole night dancing with this guy, so they will think that you were in. Uh, and, and they won't believe that it's really a murder that followed a rape. So murder becomes connected to the idea of freedom in a complicated way, right? Because at this point, in a way, they're not free anymore because they know that the police will eventually find out. And they're afraid initially, and then they discover that the police has connected the uh, murder to them, and therefore uh, the police, they're, they're wanted for questioning initially, and then uh, they, they're just wanted for, for the murder. However, in a way, this twist gives them freedom. Because at this point, there is no going back. It's not possible for them simply to go home to Daryl for Thelma, or to go home to Jimmy and the diner for Louise. And so, as long as they keep moving, they're free, and they can enjoy freedom in a way that is truly liberating for them. And so, that's when this becomes a hardcore, a, a real a road movie. They stop at a motel to regroup and plan. Here, uh, Luis will make plans to go to Mex Mexico, right? Uh, and this sounds reminiscent again of the hitchhiker, right? How the criminal in the hitchhiker wants to escape go to Mexico. However, the issue is that, as we know, as we will learn later, at this point, we don't know exactly, we understand vaguely that something horrible has happened to Texas. Therefore, they're in Arkansas. Driving through Texas would be the shortest way to Mexico. And, and they need to be quick, right, before the police will understand they're responsible for Arlen's death. Uh, and before they catch up with them. However, since Luis doesn't want to go back to Tex Texas, they have to drive from Arkansas around Texas in order to get to Mexico, and eventually they will die in the Grand Canyon. This, this is as far as they go. However, I, I didn't put a map this time for the film because the film was mostly shot in California and Utah. Okay? So... It's mostly a fictional journey they make. They stop at a second motel because the idea, the plan elaborated by Louise, is she calls Jimmy, tells Jimmy, I have $6,700 in the bank. Bring me this money. Uh, actually, wire me this money through Western Union. And she wants to use this money. After all, it's... $6,700 in the 1990s, right? So it makes sense that with this money, uh, she can uh, try, she and, Louis, and, and Thelma can try to uh, start a second life in Mexico. So the second motel is the place where the money uh, uh, should be connected. When she gets to the motel, she finds Jimmy there. So Jimmy has... Uh, flown in with the money instead of wiring the money. Not only that, but Jimmy has brought with him a ring and he wants to propose. Because Jimmy is still a man, so he feels that he's losing control of Luis, whatever happened to Luis. He thinks this is the only chance he has to stay with her and therefore he will propose. So in here, you experience two different themes through different male characters. Because for the first time, we're introduced fully to Jimmy, who, again, can be jealous, can be controlling, is not as bad as the other man, but not, not without faults either. And of course, he proposes. She says, no, clearly, they have one last night together. We see them at breakfast, very much in love with each other, but Jimmy will get on a cab and go back home. And 
Salma, instead, will spend the night with JD, who is none other than Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt had done a few movies, a handful of movies, mostly uncredited parts. And this was the big introduction of Brad Pitt to the American public. And, and uh, uh, after this film, he really received a lot of offers and bigger contracts. And you can easily understand why, right? In, at this point in his life, Brad Pitt uh, plays the part, uh, part, part of the lover boy perfectly. So JD is a hitchhiker that they pick on the, on the road at the insistence of Thelma. Think about Detour and, and how, how himself doesn't have to pick any hitchhiker. He decided, decides to do that with Vilma and uh, there will be consequences, same with JD. So, yes, JD will spend the night and introduce Thelma to sex, to proper sex. So, uh, sexual freedom is one of the themes. At the same time, JD will steal the money, will steal the $6,700, and therefore, at this point, all, all they have is each other and a car. But they have to be on the run. They have to continue. There is only freedom on the road for them. And this is where Selma becomes the full woman Louise could have grown into if Louise had not suffered a rape, had not had this trauma that kept her down. Because uh, to remedy the situation with the money, Thelma is responsible for losing the money. Because Thelma goes to breakfast, she's very naive as usual, she's very happy, she has this uh, I have fact uh, face, uh, expression on her face, sits down for breakfast, Louis talks to her, what happened to you, something happened to you last night, and, and Thelma says, now I understand what the fuss is about when it comes to sex, because she was not sexually satisfied with Daryl. And she talks about JD, and then Louis says, where is JD now? And, and Thelma says, oh, he's in the shower, I left him in the room. They said, you, and you left the money in the room? They both ran to the room. There is no JD, there is no money. So Thelma is responsible, but Thelma is now thriving, because Thelma cannot go back to her situation <laughs> because of the murder. So the murder is liberating in some way, and Thelma, has learned how to rob a store from JD. JD is a small time criminal, uh, and before they engage in sex in the room, JD explains how he robs a place. He takes a hair dryer in lieu of a gun and provides Thelma with the proper script for a well executed robbery. What do you tell people? And this is what Bonnie and Clyde should have learned, right? Because clearly, Bonnie and Clyde are not good at entering a place, being acknowledged as, as robbers, and having people comply with their instructions. JD tells them, oh, this is how you do it. You enter, you are very calm, with a calm, soothing voice. You say, don't lose your head, nobody loses their head, uh, and, and do this and do that, etc. And Thelma will execute the script with great control, with great flair. This is a completely different Thelma from the beginning, right? It's like if Roberto in Il Sorpasso had become Bruno and a better version of Bruno. So they now have money to continue on their trip to Mexico, their attempt to find freedom in Mexico. And both now feel empowered because there is no going back to a kind of society where women are oppressed by men, by their roles, by rules, etc. So they proceed on lecturing men on how to behave. The same way the first lecture was delivered to Harlan. He didn't want to listen to that lecture about no is no, and he died. Then they give a lecture, an ironic lecture, this is partly a comedy, to a truck driver whom they encounter several times on the road, and the truck driver is always uh, doing things with his tongue and other lewd gestures, so they pretend 
they want to have a good time with him. They stop in this uh, deserted locale, and then first they lecture the, this, this driver, telling him, why do you do these things? What are you trying to accomplish? And then they shoot at his truck, and, and the truck blows up, which is very Ridley Scott. And it's the kind of scene, frankly, I would have cut uh, from the film. The film is more than two hours long, could have been a bit shorter. The second comedic interlude in the escape is with a cop. Uh, a cop that is labeled as a Nazi, very tight, very dapper, very elegant, almost looks even the way his body is sculpted like a fake cop who's really a stripper, approaches them because they're speeding, and then, of course, he's on the radio. And they know, Salman and Luis know that from the radio, the cop will learn that they're wanted by the FBI and by Arkansas police. So they use the gun to discern uh, 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 the, the cop, and, and they put the cop in the trunk of his police car. And they, before they do that, they shoot the uh, trunk twice so that there are air holes and he can breathe. And later on, there is another comedic bit when a black cyclist will uh, ride his bicycle by the car while smoking a joint. And when he realizes that there is a cop in the trunk, and the cop says, the the keys are over there. His finger comes out and says, the keys are over there. Opens the trunk. He will instead lean down and uh, uh, blow weed smoke into the trunk and leave. So during the last part of the film, Felma and Louise are on the run, but they're liberated and they finally reach a level of awareness that is uh, labeled a weakness. So Felma will say, I feel awake. Finally, in life, I feel awake. The last man they interact with it is Al, the policeman, the detective who took on the case initially, and Al understands a little bit about their situation. Not only he understands that probably Arlen was a bad guy, and they acted as some kind of self-defense. He also understands that Louise acted that way because she was raped in Texas. But he's trying to negotiate with them to bring them in. However, there is a system, right? So Al can be, in some ways, because Al himself is a prototypical male, you see him as a man's man, uh, uh, jerking, uh, uh, joking with the other cops enjoying the chase of, of these women. However, Hal would like to negotiate some kind of a deal, but at this point, there is no way that they'll have to do some prison time. And it is Thelma at this point that says, I cannot go back. Thelma says, I have experienced life in a different way. I cannot go back, not just to prison, but to Darwin. Right? And finally, when they're cornered by the police in the vicinity of the Grand Canyon, they understand that the same way that the road granted them freedom, and the only freedom they found was on the road because society, whenever they stopped, society was a male oppressive society, male dominated oppressive society. They decide to make mobility their last and only choice. It's Thelma, who's now the leading character in the duo, that says, let's keep going. But in front of them, they have a canyon. So they will fly off the road. And the last image in the film is them in the sky, right? In flight on their car. And therefore encapsulating this moment of freedom or the fact that they remained awake and alive until the very end.
they refused to re-enter a system that it would, would have made oppressed within a jail, within the system, the judicial system, etc. Okay? So <coughs> this is the synopsis and how the film develops its various themes. <coughs> now, one of the reasons why this film after 32 years is still a good film is that it is full of small details that tell the story, but only was made by a great director with great actors. Even the other actors, of course, Al is Arvi Keitel, who's a great actor. Daryl is overplayed uh, by oh my God, McDonald's, something like that, who, who was um, Felma's actress, Gina Davis' former uh, boyfriend. Uh, but altogether, the film still works. And at this point, we have enough time to see the initial setup. So in the initial setup, where we see Thelma and Louise, one in the home, the other in the diner, and then in the car, compare how they behave in different ways around men, around uh, the, the customers, the colleagues, and then the, the kind of freedom they experience together in the car until they make their first deviation, the detour that eventually uh, will deny them whatever freedom they have found temporarily together. 